it's time for Coffee with the Chicken Ladies, a podcast for people who love chickens. Hey, everybody, and welcome. It's Chrissy and Holly from Coffee with the Chicken Ladies. We're here, and this is episode number 129 of our podcast, where we talk about everything chicken, family, fun, and more chickens. More chickens. We drink a ton of coffee. I'm talking a ton. But most importantly, we hug chickens every day. And we kiss them, too. Don't forget. We brew coffee from a little coffee house in historic Gettysburg, PA. Phantom Coffee Roasters. Holly Ann, what kind of coffee are we brewing today? Well, today is the Kenyan with notes of dark chocolate and caramel. And caramel is your favorite. Uh Uh-huh. So it's pretty yummy. If you want to get some, where do you go? Phantomroasters.com. And follow them on Facebook and Instagram. So are you ready to sip some coffee and chat? I am. But first, a word from our sponsor. We have some exciting news to share from our sponsor, Grubbly Farms. This month, you can receive 30% off if you're a first-time buyer. I'm a longtime subscriber, and my flock love the healthy, nutritious treats. Orders $40 and more ship free. If you haven't heard, Grubbly's has a fantastic layer pellet and crumble feed. It's packed with plant and insect protein. It's perfect for those picky chickens and ducks. This offer does not apply to subscriptions and cannot be combined with any other discounts. It's a great time to try Grubbly Farms if you haven't yet. Use the code CWTCL30 for 30% off your first purchase. Try it today. The question is, how are you doing? I am doing very well. How about you? I'm good. I'm busy. I have the chicks going, planting more herbs, as you know. (laughs) (laughs) Always plant those herbs, man. I went in the mill the other day to buy feed, and they had a lot of herbs uh, for sale up front. So I grabbed another thyme because my time was absolutely decimated when we had that cold snap in my December. I made it. Oh, lucky you. My sage made it and my thyme. My sage made it, but my thyme, My no. gorgeous rosemary that was in a lot of our social media stuff. Mm-hmm. The huge bush that was growing for five years did not make it. Mine didn't either. I basically cried over it. Yeah. <gasps> Yeah, that's hard. So I have to start over with another rosemary bush. I got another herb, but gosh, I can't remember what it was. Oh, it was dill. It was dill. I love dill. Me too. And with eggs, dill is really good. It's, it's fantastic. The other thing that's going crazy in mine is my mint. It's everywhere. Oh, it's yeah. coming out everywhere. So mojitas, that's what we're going to be doing. Why don't we have them now? <laughs> Get on that, please. Yeah, exactly. The mojito boat. So yeah, I've been loving all my babies. I hope everybody is loving seeing some chick spam on Instagram. The only thing better than chick spam is lamb spam. I like the puppy spam too. And all the baby spam. Okay. (laughs) Although every time you pull up our Instagram on our explore page, there are babies. I don't know why, but there are. I don't know either. (laughs) I don't know. It's the weirdest thing ever. It is, yeah. Okay, well. (laughs) They're cute too. Baby spam in spring is the best. (laughs) Yes, exactly. So how's everything on your end? Great. My brooder full of Asiatics is very messy. Oh, yeah. You've been talking about that they're just kicking food everywhere. They have figured out the the dark Brahmas are the worst and the best of the lot. And Pete and I are enthralled with her is Jane Goodall the Langshan. Uh Uh-huh. She's just bigger than the other chicks. She's so placid. Yeah. We just, we spend a lot of time watching Jane because she's just so sweet. Yeah. Yeah. Mine are good. They love getting on top of the brooder plate. So I put a little food on there for them. Then they scratch it everywhere and That's have a good fun. idea. Yeah. They love coming in and laying on us and <laughs> doing a bunch of stuff. So it's always fun. This is that special age when they're that little mm-hmm. that it's really a lot of fun with the chicks. And with the warmer temperatures, you can get them out in the sun, which is great. So I saw some news from your county. Yeah. I know what you're going to say. Yeah. Recently, Hartford County, Maryland has been working on a law change to classify chickens as domestic animals instead of livestock. Yes, which gives them a whole bunch more in rights with their care and everything else. Way more protection under the law. I Mm -hmm. thought that was fascinating. And it's going to be interesting to watch and see if any other local areas or any areas across the country start to make this change as well. Well, we know chickens are ranking up on the pet chart. And, Mm -hmm. you know... They're not just hot. They're not just trendy. They're hot forever, you know? So I would think so. Everybody wants them for their backyards and they're lovable and they're backyard pets now, not just livestock. Mm -hmm. So it's a good thing. That's for sure. I think it's a good change as well. Yeah, 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 definitely. Okay. So this brings us to this. If you're listening to our show and you're loving it, head over to Apple Podcast and leave us a written review. It does amazing things for the growth of our show. And while you're there, 
hit that subscribe button. That way you never miss an episode. And it's also a great way to help us grow. If you're looking for other ways to help the podcast, you can share your favorite episodes on social media. You can tell some chicken loving friends about the podcast. You can visit our Etsy shop, check out the t-shirts and mugs that we have there. You can become a patron of the show, patreon.com slash coffee with the chicken ladies, see our different levels of membership. And the other thing you can do to help support the podcast is visit our website, use our affiliate links and discount codes and buy products from our sponsors. Yay! Hey, Chris. Yeah. Do you like subscription boxes? Does it have anything to do with chickens? Of course. Then yeah. Let me take a minute to tell you about the chicken love box. If you love goodies for your chickens and you, you need to go to chickenlove.com. I love the mega box. Tons of useful products for my flock and a chicken tea for me. You can't go wrong with a chicken tea. They are so cute and so soft. In the February box, I absolutely love the red iron rooster trivet and the seed block. I really love that egg timer. It's going to be great when I'm baking. And those chicken stickers are going to be awesome on notes I send out. Boxes start at $39 a month. They ship immediately after your order and shipping is always free. Such a great deal. Don't wait. Get off the nest and click already. Use the code CWTCL50 for 50% off your first box of a three-month subscription or more. That's chickenlove.com. That's chickenluv.com. Get your subscription today. Have you heard of Strong Animals Chicken Essentials? They make natural supplements for your flock. Strong Animals has used plant-based products and natural approaches to promote the health and vitality of backyard flocks. Their products contain organic essential oils, prebiotics, and other natural ingredients to support the immune system and digestive health. Give your chicks and chickens what they need to thrive with Strong Animals health products. Visit GetStrongAnimals.com today. The Breed Spotlight is brought to you by Murray McMurray Hatchery, defining quality for generations. For over a century, Murray McMurray Hatchery has remained a trusted family-owned business working tirelessly to ensure our poultry meet the highest standards. Whether you are an experienced enthusiast or just embarking on the journey, look to McMurray Hatchery for guaranteed quality rare and heritage breeds, low minimums, and all the supplies you need to raise your flock. Request a free catalog today. La, 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 la. It's time for the Breed Spotlight, yeah. 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 This week's Breed Spotlight is... The Polish. And it's a pretty happy chicken, so I wanted to go with a happy <coughs> springtime introduction for this chicken. It's one of my favorite chickens out there. The beautiful Polish chicken is a beloved heritage breed that is best known for its large crest. Has, Very any- large. has anyone out there not seen a Polish? Please don't raise your hand. <laughs> yeah, I mean, honestly, the first place I ever saw the Polish chicken was in a book called Extraordinary Chickens, and there was a Polish on the cover. They're amazing. Yeah, yeah. And ever since then, I was like, wow. That actually, it may have been it may have been the site of that Polish that sent me down the rabbit hole of rare breed chickens. I mean, they're definitely unique. They're kind of like the silky in that they're a chicken all in their own. You know, like they have all these fun things about them and they're just very fun. They're also a very old breed. So old that no one really knows where they came from, even though they've been around for hundreds of years. They've been around a long time. A long time, yeah. They're extremely popular as show chickens, but they can also pull their weight when it comes to egg laying. Oh, they're good layers. There are good layers, yeah. Yeah, for sure. They can be bearded or non-bearded, and there are bantam versions as well. Super cute. I know. Now, the Polish are currently listed in the watch category of the Livestock Conservancy's conservation priority list. Let's get them into recovering. Come on, let's do it. They must be getting close, honestly. They have to be getting close because I feel like they're so popular. And rightly so. (laughs) Yeah, (laughs) I mean, really. Sometimes you will see this breed called Polans or Padoas. Now, there's no established connection to Poland that we know of. There's no evidence anywhere that they came from Poland. Poland. Right. A lot of sources believe the breed did come from Eastern Europe and probably from Asia before that. They were mentioned in European art and writing as early as the 1400s, and they were very popular with both Dutch and Italian breeders early on. They're just gorgeous. They're great layers. You know, what else are you going to – it's a great chicken. It is a great chicken. There are a few different theories about how they got their name. Some say they were from Poland, which is possible. 
Just because we don't have any evidence of it does not make it not true. Yeah, because exactly. Where did this name get pulled out of? There has to be someone back somewhere that said they're from Poland. Let's call them the Polish. It's possible. Some say that they were named because of their crest's resemblance to the feathered headgear worn by Polish soldiers. That's what we talked about in our previous Breed Spotlight of the Polish. And while that's possible, it's also Poland changed hands a lot throughout European history. So while it's possible, I'm not putting my money on that one. The third theory points out that the word pol, P-O-L or P-O-L-L, is an archaic word for head or top of the head. Okay. You find it in several European languages. It's still used in veterinary anatomy. We refer to sheep, cattle, etc. without horns as pole. Correct. And if you're doing anatomy of, say, the horse, the top of the head is the pole. Maybe they were simply known as poles. And as they moved across Europe, people may have added the ish on the end. to make their the word... big heads or big crest. <laughs> well, I was going to say to make the word more familiar, but yeah. Now, Padua is a different kettle of fish altogether. Padua refers to the city or the area of Padua in Italy. Right. And that is an area where they were bred early on in their European history. I don't Maybe. know. Which one seems most likely to you? I don't know. I'm a dreamer more. So I kind of like the little soldier hat kind of story. Okay. I like that one. Okay. We've talked about that one in the past. And right. it's kind of, that would be neat that they were named after that. But who really knows? Yeah. At this point, I mean, it's kind of irrelevant, but at the same time, it's interesting to look into. Because I'm interested in words, the theory about pole right. meaning top of the head it is really interesting to me. Yeah, yeah. I mean, and that's what they're known for as a chicken is it, their huge crest. Exactly. Their head. Yeah. You know, that's one of their good and bad things. I mean, because unfortunately with all that feather up there, they have a hard time seeing. Yes. But, you know, there's other precautions that you have to take when you have this chicken, but that is what they're known for and what is makes them so beautiful. Right. Exactly right. Now, the Polish were in the UK during the 18th century, so we're talking 1700s, and in the US in the early 19th century. Right. The Livestock Conservancy notes that they probably began arriving in the US in the 1830s and 1840s, so that early, and they've become pretty popular by the 1850s. Pre-Civil War, you were finding a lot of Polish in people's flocks. Every chicken lady wants a Polish. Seriously. Even back then. Right. right. I mean, nothing is going to change their beauty. They're beautiful chickens, and they're unique, and they're different looking, and everyone is going to want that chicken in their flock, exactly. even if you're in the 1850s. Right. They were accepted into the American Poultry Association Standard of Perfection in the Continental Class. Okay. And they appeared in the original printing in 1874 in the following varieties. Okay. So let's go down the list. White, crested, black. Golden. Silver. And white. And all non-bearded. Right. They were all non-bearded. Now, the golden and the silver, we should note, even though they're just called golden and silver, they're both laced. Everything's laced. Yeah, so very beautiful. In 1883, the rest of the AP accepted varieties appeared in the standard of perfection. Okay, so let's go through this list. The bearded golden. The bearded silver. The bearded white. The bearded buff laced. The non-bearded buff laced. The non-bearded white crested blue. And non-bearded black crested white. I think we covered all the bases there. Yes, everything. <laughs> So let's go into their size. They're light body chickens. They're little. Yeah, surprisingly little. If if you look at them from a distance, you might not realize how small they are. So the hens are going to weigh in at about four and a half pounds and roosters around six. So you're looking at like little. leghorn size. Everything's coming in leghorn size yeah. these days. But I kind of like chickens on that size because you can tend to have a few more of them. Yeah. You can add more to your flock and... I love big and little. I love both for different reasons. Yeah, I do But if you're looking at space restraints, this size, you could have a few more. Oh, heck. If you can only have small chickens, because I've put some thought into this. Yeah. If you can only have small chickens and you don't want, say, Egyptian Fayumis. (laughs) Yes, you don't want Egyptian (laughs) Fayumis. I'll always have my Fayumis, but I think my future Fayumis may have their own yard. We'll say they're a a child a mother can only love. They are an acquired taste, I think. (laughs) I adore them, but yes. So anyway, I would have probably Polish, definitely some Leghorns, Sicilian Buttercup. They're all around the same size. And Hamburgs, probably. Yeah. They're yeah. all around that four pound. And yep. what that four pound size is, it's totally light bodied. It's just above Bantam. The other so, thing about those breeds that I just named, they're all really good layers. Oh, yeah. They're all really, really good layers. But, you know, just above Bantam oh. gets you more chickens in a smaller area. Yes. Yep. Yep, more bang for your buck right there. 
Now, the other thing that you find with the Polish is that V-comb and those large, wide nostrils. Oh, yeah. And that trait's shared by a lot of the older continental breeds, especially the Houdan Ooh. and the Creve Coeur. And it's probably because the Polish was a foundation breed for them. Yeah. I went with the Houdan instead of just the Polish mm-hmm. because my heart was always going to the Houdans. Once I looked everything up and looked at them, I was like, okay, I have to have them. That's why I'm a proud Houdan mama right now. Right. But they are descendants of the Polish. Yes, definitely. Pretty much all the Polish varieties have slate-colored legs. They do, and they have this awesome, neat, big bouffant with these amazing white earlobes. It is interesting that the hens and the roosters have different crests, isn't it? It is. So the hen does have that dainty bouffant. It looks like a hairdo. Yes. And the roosters have like this wild shag. It's wild. It is wild. <laughs> and you look at them and you're like, that is very different. They look like they just came out of like a 60s rock band or something. It's an easy way to tell if you're looking at a hen or a roo, that's oh, for sure. Oh, heck yes. I mean, the bouffants, the girls have, it's almost the manicured, like it looks like they it's put pretty. their head in that little Oh, the, the old-fashioned hair dryer? Yeah. <laughs> yeah they put down in the dryer. Yeah. <laughs> it didn't came up. And then the boys are just like, hey, yeah, I just came out of the shag. Looking and, wild. Yeah, mm-hmm. for sure. So they are pretty cool. And they have the white earlobes, which I always love on the chickens. They're not as visible. Nothing like, that's visible. They got so many feathers there. <laughs> exactly. <laughs> now, all the crested birds in the Polish family, we touched on this with the nostrils. And this is all part and parcel of their very unique vaulted skull. Correct. So essentially, there's a large bony lump on the top. Right. And it has apertures to let the feathers grow out. Now, on chicks, this is all soft. Oh, yeah. And has to harden over time. So you have to be very careful of pecking injuries. Yes. Or other trauma to their heads. The whole mass will harden, but it will always retain those apertures. Yes. It, it's You have to be really, really careful with the chicks. You do. Mm-hmm. No really little kids holding them and dropping them. Nothing like that. You have to be really careful. If you have an aggressive chick in the brooder, you might have to split your brooder because exactly. you can't have pecking trauma to that spot. That's the other thing. I always feel like even if you have one brooder, you should be ready to go with two at a moment's notice because you never know when you have to separate. I cannot disagree with you. I think that that's just being... I would say it's being overprepared, but in the best way possible. Yeah, because I feel like the brooder is different than just having a pop-up. Now, you can have a pop-up as a brooder, but this also means you have to have heat sources and everything else ready to go right? in case there is bullying, in case there is sickness, and you have to separate them at a moment's notice. So your Houdans are in that class with their little mohawks. Oh, they're cute. Yes, they are. And I guess one of the really good things about the fact that you have Cochins and Houdans together is that their personalities really mesh. And a Buff Orpington. Well, Margo. Uh, exactly. Not exactly known for being aggressive. So, <laughs> Margo. She little Margo. That was one She's of my cute. most favorite names Margo? for her. Yeah. yeah. She fits it too. So, yeah, no, they're all in there together. I almost think the Houdans are a little bit more spicy than everybody else. Well, they're a little bigger. They were a little older. Yeah. They look at everybody like, hmm. Because they can be a little fragile as chicks, apparently, the Houdans can. Yeah. yeah. They're super cute, though. They are. Okay. So, the Polish hens are really good layers of large white eggs. Now, here's the thing. They're not going to be a broody hen for you. They're not going to set on some eggs and hatch them for you. Apparently, there are more exceptions to this rule than you might expect, but you cannot bank on it. No. If it happens, it happens, but yeah. So they're kind of the opposite of the silky. You know, the silky's going to sit on a rock. Right. These birds are going to be like, I laid my egg. I'm done. See you later. Exactly. I'm out of yeah. here. I have to go to the hairdresser and fix my bouffant. <laughs> <laughs> I love the hen. <laughs> the hen's crest is fantastic. I know some people like the shaggier boy look. But I love that little hairdo. I love the hairdo. And it just, I keep seeing, even on the Jetsons, like the little hairdo thing come down over them and then they're on the conveyor it's, belt. It's the old up. style of um, hair. Does your does your salon not have them? No, it does oh, not. mine does. <laughs> yeah. So, you know, like if you're getting color done, you go and sit and like they have these nice chairs in the corner. They'll give you a glass of wine and you get the old style dryer. Oh, gosh. Oh, yeah. No, no. It's fun. It's actually oddly relaxing. Anyway, we digress, <laughs> however. We got the Polish have us talking about hairdos. So- They are good layers, but some would say that they're not great winter layers. That's what I saw too. They'll lay most of their eggs during the warmer months. That's a good reason to preserve some of their eggs. Right now, start preserving eggs for fall and winter. Oh, yeah. Because right now is when you have eggs aplenty. And the numbers I saw were all over the place. I saw anything from 150 to over 200. Yeah, I think they're kind of, I can see them in that class category. Mm -hmm. I mean, you might have a really good egg layer that's an exception, or you might have right in the middle at 200, 150 to a little over 200. You're probably going to get three to four eggs a week from them, which is a really nice contribution. I mean, again, nothing beats a leghorn. 
<laughs> no, no. But they pull their weight for a really fancy looking chicken. They do their job They're really fancy. well. They're fancy. Okay, so these little birds do have great personalities. I really think they're a great family bird. Absolutely. Now, this might make you laugh a little bit, but our old friend Lewis Wright, it was his opinion that if Polish chickens are properly cared for, they quickly become exceedingly affectionate and tame. They're great for the backyard families. They're very gentle. They're laid back, but they startle very easily if their crest is too big and they get feather blind. Well, yeah, they are. They have that huge crest and they can't see very well. well. Feather blindness is a thing. It is a thing. So it's one of the things that you have to take care of, kind of clipping around the eyes so that they can see well. Right. You can talk to them so that they know you're there. And you can even teach your children to do the same and to approach them gently. But if you're going to free range them at any time, you need to clip some feathers. Oh, yeah. Because they're completely vulnerable to predators that way. I would not free range this chicken myself. Well, we don't do, we only do supervised free range anyway, but I would never put this chicken outside to free range anywhere. No way. They can't see anybody coming. They can even be in danger from their own flock mates. Oh, yeah. Because they can sustain pecking injuries if they can't see. So you probably, unless you're showing them, you probably want to do some hair cutting on them. Oh, Just, that's the fun part. Chickens need those eyes. They need the grooming. We occasionally have to trim my honeysuckle's crest. Oh, yeah. My Swedish flower silky cross. Yeah. And we'll know it's time because she'll just start moving a lot more cautiously. Yeah. And you can see, you want to be able to see their eyeballs. Absolutely. So you, they, can, you they, can't see their eyeballs and they can't see you. They need their vision. Yeah. Yeah. So because of this, we really don't think they're the best birds for a rough and tumble homestead. They are great additions to a well-tended backyard flock, though, and perfect for chicken ladies who want a unique and beautiful bird. Yeah, they take extra care, but they're going to lay a lot of eggs for you. They're friendly with your family. I just would call them an, a great all-around family bird. Oh, yeah. And to have children with them, they're very lovable. Just they need some grooming. They need some extra care. They're light-bodied. They're going to need some heating elements during the winter. So, you know, just keep those things in mind. Right, exactly. They can tolerate heat pretty well, too, but they need to have plenty of shade and cool water. Honestly, they're- That's a, every chicken. Though. Right. They're a bird that does well in temperate situations, but you've got to watch them in the extremes. Yeah. So in the cold, what you have to watch for is all the feathered feet, the crest and everything else, feather freeze. So you don't want them to walk in something wet and then have it freeze on them. They just need some extra care that way. You want to keep those crests dry and free from ice or snow. Oh, that yeah. That can cause frostbite and illness. You know, it can lower their immune system. They, they're they just, honestly, they don't prosper in cold, wet weather. They're kind of miserable. Yeah. They remind me of the silky that way. Yeah, yeah. They're a little more hardy than the silky. Well, like though. you said, birds with feathered feet, you have to watch the frostbite. You have to watch the same thing with the Polish crest. I'm watching all my Sam Favreau's feet, everybody. Yep. You have the Brahmas, and you have to watch everything. You have to watch those feet with the feathers because it can happen. And it did happen one time this winter. I went back and it was a really cold rain. Mm -hmm. And I ended up having to bring Clover in because she tends to stay out in the rain. It doesn't matter if it's cold, wet rain, warm rain, whatever. <laughs> yeah. So I go out as soon as it starts raining and I'm like, oh no, you're coming in because she had already had some freeze on her feet. Oh boy. Yeah. So you have to really watch them. And with the feathers... It's a great thing. They're beautiful, but it takes grooming. The crest, right. Yeah, or they can get picked on by their, their peers in their runs. Lewis Wright, over 100 years ago, almost 150 years ago, talks about, and we've heard, we've heard friends with Polish say this, a Polish cockerel will stand in the yard while his hens just pull the feathers out of his head until he's bloody. Yeah. They just stand there yeah. and let the hens pick on them that way. They're very, very... Laid back and gentle chickens. They are. They're worth it for your family. That's for sure. Absolutely. So the all important question here, where can you get these beauties? They are definitely more available these days. Marie McMurray has some beautiful colors. Buff laced. Golden. Silver. White. And white crested black Polish. That's a big amount of variety. It's a lot of variety that you can get over at McMurray. I'm not sure if I like the buff, the golden, or the silver lace the best. I love the lace polish. I though. love them all. So pretty. Now, you can also visit the Livestock Conservancy's Breeders Directory, and you can check out the Polish Breeders Club Facebook page if you're looking for local sources. Yeah, but the fact that McMurray has all those different varieties is amazing. And they're sexed. Yeah, you can't go wrong. I'd like me a couple Polish hens. <laughs> I have the hoodans, but now I want more Polish too. Uh, I don't know. Those, I'm out of space. I'm out of space. 
Yeah, exactly. I know. <laughs> We've got babies in the brooder right now. Anyway, Polish are amazing additions. Now you know what I'm about to say. If you have a Polish, and this week I want to see those pictures <laughs> flooding in to our Instagram DMs. We want to see your Polish. We want to flood our stories with our Polish chicken pictures. Please send them over. We will give you a story. We love to see them. If you're looking for a chicken coop that's produced in a planet-friendly, sustainable way, try Nestera. Each coop is made from highly durable, 100% recycled plastic that keeps the equivalent of up to 2,000 shampoo bottles out of a landfill. Their clean, modern design will fit into any garden or run area and comes with an industry-beating 25-year warranty and a range of handy accessories. Simple to put together, so quick and easy to clean, and most importantly, red mite resistant. Your chickens will love it. Quick shipping from Nestera.us. For a 5% discount, use the affiliate link in our show notes, on our website, and on Instagram. Link in bio. Check them out today. Roosties proudly sponsors Coffee with the Chicken Ladies. We personally use Roosties products with our chickens and we're huge fans. They have their awesome nesting pads, do-it-yourself feeder and waterer kits, and they've just released their best product ever, a new chick feeder and waterer set. They have adjustable legs to keep food and water clean. They're super well-made, and the feeder even has a removable lid so it can easily be filled from the top. So if you're raising chicks or keeping chickens, all their products are available for prime delivery on Amazon.com. Check out the Roosty store on Amazon or follow the link in our show notes. Okay, so let's move on to main topic. Yeah. Yeah. This week, we have an extra special guest. This week, we are joined by the British Home Welfare Trust's Jane Howarth and her associate, Gaynor Davies. We're catching up with Jane and finding out what's been happening throughout the year. Here's our interview. Enjoy. Jane, thank you so much for visiting with us again. Welcome. It's an absolute pleasure to be here with you again. Thank you for inviting me. Hey, Jane, how are you doing? I'm okay. Yeah, I'm sort of really glad that spring is around the corner. The daffs are up in the garden and it's all looking a little bit rosier out there. Much, much. I'm like, come on, spring, come on. I know, I know. (laughs) Yeah, we've had a challenging sort of time just before Christmas. um, Avian flu sort of battered us and we had to stop rehoming hens for a while. So that was a, a real disappointment. It was tempered by the fact that we had a success in rehoming our 900,000th hen in December. Wow. Yeah, thank you. We had to keep it quiet, really, because avian flu was just wreaking havoc. And this was from Scotland, where the regulations were slightly different. So we were obviously all within the guidelines that regulations. But um, it was absolutely wonderful to get her out. And I am just beyond excited already because we're heading for the millionth. And I, I'm a nightmare already with even with people that I just say, oh, thank you for your donation or something. And I said, no, we're on our way to our million. Woo, 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 woo. <laughs> just so when you excited. hit a million, we need to celebrate on the show for sure. Oh, no. Yes, please. It would yes, be please. amazing. That is I a know. huge milestone. Starting the from the ad in the paper, <laughs> yeah. 900,000 chickens. Yeah. I'm going to say this again. Jane, you inspire all of us that we can make a difference in the world. Definitely. You have done that. You've made yeah. a difference in the world. Yeah, it's sure. a lovely feeling. It's a lovely feeling that so many hens have had that second chance. And also, you know, you've converted so many people to sort of viewing them differently. You know, they see them as pets rather than just, you know, cheap food or livestock. You know, it's that perception, isn't it? They're it, such a brilliant creature yeah, and a, exactly. they give so much love and they're just amazing little beings out there that deserve all the best. How are you doing with your flock right now? My little flock of three are unbelievable, actually. I keep telling them that their production rate at 66.6% is pretty good going, girls. Wow. Because so, they're quite elderly. They're probably five, six, between five and six years old now. So it's not every day, but I pick up one or two eggs every day still from them. No. So they're good girls, yeah. I nearly got more before Christmas because I always like to get some at Christmas, but they're so well settled, mine. And I thought, no, I'm not going to upset the apple cart. They're really happy. And and all the hens had homes, so the pressure wasn't on. But um, we started rehoming again in January. And so far, we've managed to rehome, I think it's about 8,000 birds this year. So that's kind of okay. You know, we can't wait to get more. So, Are there any new developments with the British Hen Welfare Trust? Oh, yes, most definitely. (laughs) Please catch us up. We want to hear. 
Yeah, it's, it's exciting, actually. I think I told you we launched our massive open online course last May. Yes. That was just a phenomenal success. We were so lucky. Within the first six weeks, we had over 1,200 participants from 49 countries around the world. So we were just blown away by that. But um, as a result of feedback that we got, which was really positive, we've decided to split the course into two. So we're in the process at the moment of creating two courses, one which is more designed for lay hen keepers and the other one which is more designed specifically for vets so that we can get into the technical stuff. That's in progress and probably will launch hopefully late summer, something like that. I don't know whether you have it in the States, but we have something called CPD, Continuing Professional Development. So we're hoping that by undertaking this veterinary course, it will go towards being part of veterinary CPD. So that will encourage more vets to take part. I think that's the number one thing that we need to get to globally. We need to find a way to get our veterinary schools and get in there and say to them, we need veterinarians to know when they come out how to treat a backyard chicken. Because we talked last time about where they are chickens in the world of pets. Weren't they four or five somewhere you told us? Um, They've come up the ranks. They're number four now. It's dogs, cats. I never remember the third one, whether it's rabbits or fish, but they're number four chickens. So they've definitely come up the ranking in the UK. Right. So having the veterinarians come out with a training of something besides industrial treatment of chickens is a must because we're pushing the envelope. We have them in our backyards. We need medical care for these chickens. What what we're seeing here, we do have farm vets who see poultry, but the majority of veterinarians that are doing, I would say, large scale and important work with pet poultry are generally small animal vets Mm -hmm. that specialize in avian work. Absolutely agree with you. And we've got the same situation over here. And the MOOC will definitely help. We have a really decent number of youngsters, actually student vets, joining the charity, A, because they want to learn more about chickens, because they recognize that there's a greater need for knowledge and experience. So that's wonderful. I mean, I think up in Scotland, we had 35 student vets join our local team. They just sort of, you know, went along, got their hands sort of dirty, got stuck into sort of our rehoming work and loved it. So we're developing that. And that's a sort of another part of our work. We've actually now got some student grants that we're offering out to students to enable them to sort of undertake research. It's very early days and I'm not particularly familiar with this sort of area of work, but apparently it takes a while for it to sort of gain traction. COVID didn't help. But we've had one small piece of work carried out about enrichment and how quickly chickens get bored if the enrichment isn't changed regularly, et cetera, et cetera, which is fairly obvious. But it was a first year student and it was a really good way to sort of inspire him to get more deeply into sort of learning about poultry and getting some interesting information for us. But we've also got a lovely young vet who's had our chickens since she was 11 years old. And she's doing a three-year project into egg peritonitis. Oh, Oh, that's amazing. Yeah. That is amazing. Yeah. And actually, I haven't caught up with her for a little while, so I very, very much need to do so. She's so driven. I mean, she she said to us that adopting chickens at age 11 has completely shaped her life. And, you know, I'm thrilled. And that made me go goose bumpy from head to toe. And you had everything to do with it. You changed a young child's (laughs) life, maybe even steered her in the way of treating animals and being a veterinarian. That means a lot. Like if we all just change one person at a time, somehow. Yeah, exactly. It astonishes me that there's not more work on the reproduction of chickens. I mean, it's one of the most widely consumed forms of food worldwide, but most of the research is on preventing communicable diseases, but even more than that, maximizing nutrition for end product. Mm -hmm. I mean, we're talking about hens, we're talking about female bodies doing what female bodies do, and there just isn't enough research into that. I think that's amazing. It's so badly needed. Yeah, she's absolutely super, super lady. And I'll keep you posted because her research research is going to be amazing, you know, because it'll just give us insight that isn't there right now. We don't even have bloods benchmarking for the pet poultry. It's not there. It doesn't exist. So we haven't got to that yet for COVID sort of also sort of knocked that about really. And then we prioritize getting the massive open online course up and running and the student grants, things like that, really. So, you know, we have to take it a step at a time and make sure that we do it well. But we don't want to do is do it half baked, really. So exactly. It'll be coming that sort of work. 
Now, I know that you are dealing with avian flu in the UK and you are still in lockdown. Are you seeing the same trends in the UK that we're seeing in the US with the popularity of chickens exploding even more and a huge demand? No, we're not. And I'm very interested to hear that. I would say we're steady on our rehoming levels. But the UK government, because they've imposed lockdown on us, so all our chickens are kept inside, Mm -hmm. that does reduce the number of birds that people are able to take in. So 50% of our adoptions are repeat adoptions where people want to increase their flock because they love it so much. So we do on average between 10 and 11,000 adoptions a year. So 50% of those are people coming back from more. And as obviously you both know, if you then introduce new birds into a sort of more confined space, then you've got to go through all the merging process. So Mm. we've definitely got great enthusiasm from people out there. And our volunteers are just champing at the bit to get back to it. But it's not had a surge So, you know, when everything shut down for COVID in 2020, a demand for backyard hens went through the roof. People were looking for food security. They were, you know, they were home. We could spend time with chickens. Well, we think it's a combination of the worldwide petroleum products, both shortage and raising cost. Farmers have raised prices on eggs, which means grocery stores have raised prices on eggs. The price of eggs is very high. There's inflation worldwide. And so there's sort of the same drive for food security again. Our wow. local feed stores will get in day old chicks and they will be sold out in two hours. And we're talking hundreds of chicks. It's, it's, a, it's an explosion of chicken yeah. keeping that I've never seen in my life. Wow. Yeah. It is crazy over here right now. And I think what has a little bit to do with that we're still going and you're not are those restrictions. In right. the US, we do not have restrictions that you have to keep your chickens in. Now, we have talked about this all the time to our listeners. Right now, it is a smart idea not to let your chickens free range. There's really not much they can get in the winter that's going to be nutritious in the ground anyway. And practice that biosecurity. And the biosecurity is number one to keep them healthy. So people are able to grow their flocks here and not be on flock down. But we both keep our chickens in. Yeah. You know, so it's not a risk worth taking. It's not a risk worth taking. But you're not seeing the alarm here about avian flu that you saw last year. There are still plenty of commercial farms that have had to depopulate because they've had avian flu on their premises. I don't think it's in the news as much for whatever reason. It does still exist. But the explosion of people wanting chickens, well, it's alarming in more than one way. But yeah, I mean, I've never seen anything like this. You cannot get chicks right now. So are you seeing then growth right across the industry? I mean, uh, presumably people can just go in off the street, get some chicks, take them home without any checking on what accommodation or what. Yeah, exactly. Yes. Wow. Yes. With yeah. farm supply stores, big and small over here. And, you know, you can order day old chicks through hatcheries. And, and there a lot is, of them are sold out. And they're sold out. So that's why we feel like talking to you and our podcast is so important to educate as much as we can on that care. The only restriction that's in place here, and it's on a state level, is the minimum number that you must purchase. Right. So in Maryland, you can't just buy one chick. You have to buy three chicks. New York, I believe it's... Some of them are 12. Six chicks or 12 chicks. Yeah. Yeah. I suppose the only other regulation is in certain local places. For instance, Baltimore City, you can keep hens, but you have to have a permit and you have to... You can um, only have so many. You can only have so many. In Baltimore County, you also have to have a permit and you have to submit plans for your coop and run setup. But wow. that's very local. How variable. Over here at the moment, we've just been invited to take part in a consultation paper because the government or DEFRA, which is part of the government, is hoping to bring in registration for every single hen keeper. Whether that be one hen or 100,000 hens. So do they come out and look at your setup or just follow how many chickens you have? They basically want to have a better way, I think, to reach people quickly when there's a notifiable disease. Right. So there are some benefits to it, but we're not very keen on it being mandatory for such small flocks. 
I've had a conversation with my local vet here and she agrees that it's going to put some people off keeping chickens again because of the bureaucratic element of it. Right. We educate everybody. Biosecurity absolutely runs through the very core of everything we do because exactly. why wouldn't you? And actually, right. if, you, if you make that part of your routine, it's not onerous, is it? It just becomes part of your routine. Yes. So we very much encourage that. But we also don't think it's necessarily right to have it down to just one hen feels a bit extreme, but we don't know what the outcome will be. We're just invited to take part in the consultation. We will do. And we want to see the other things. We want to see differentiation between chickens kept as pets versus chickens kept as livestock. And at at the moment, with the swing being so heavily that it's the commercial flocks that are getting avian flu, it feels there's a little bit of a spotlight over the wrong camp, if you like. So I totally agree with that. There are registrations in the US. Again, it tends to be on a state level. But to be perfectly frank, I don't think a lot of people follow the regulation. And also, I'm really sort of surprised and and I have to say disappointed that they've got restrictions on minimums. But does that not come with expectation that they will provide secure accommodation and things like that? No. And to be perfectly honest with you, I think people would rebel against that very strongly. Okay, That's one of the reasons we started this podcast, to try to give people the resources they need. I mean, we see people who think it's appropriate and natural and good to let their chickens sleep in a tree. And then we have people whose chickens are their beloved pets and they have a secure coop and run and they even have panel heaters for when it gets below 20 degrees Fahrenheit. So sort of bringing me on to another aspect that we've been developing, and that's our Helen Helpline. Mm-hmm. So we recognised that as we were rehoming more and more birds, we were getting more and more calls, very often from people in tears, that they'd taken their bird to the vet, the vet didn't know what to do, and had either outpriced it because they didn't know what to do, or mm-hmm. just said, well, actually, we think, let's put it to sleep. Mm-hmm. We started getting calls from vets, et cetera, et cetera. So we're starting to really develop our Hen Helpline now. And we're currently in the process of getting improved funding for it because we're handling around about 100 emails and calls a week. And we're now drawing calls and inquiries from people that don't just keep our birds, but that keep any birds. And Mm -hmm. they're usually quite surprised that we take their call because it's at the moment it's completely free. As it grows, and we're just building in now, sort of asking people, will they give us a donation? And, And very often people are only too happy to. We want people to have support for their birds, but it's another aspect that we're really growing. So three of our team are all having ASQP training, which basically gives them really good first level insight into all the common problems with pet chickens. All of them have had bereavement training because, again, we take calls from people that are absolutely distraught. So what a beautiful thing. Yeah, it's really growing. And, you know, when people support us, we really do our utmost to make the most of every penny we get. And we have just spent £12,000 producing 12 videos using an external company helping us do. We've brought in a vet to help us go through the whole filming procedure. These are aimed at people that keep chickens. So there might be something as basic as how to do an examination of your chicken. Mm -hmm. The comb, the crop, the keel, the vent, it's all the points of the chicken. We found that too with a listener who reached out to us. Their chicken was sick. We say to them, look for the crop. And they're like, where is the crop? Exactly. So that's where the education comes in and where your videos are going to be so important. They need to know the anatomy of the pet yeah. they have so that they can yeah. assist and know what to look for. No, yeah. even to know what questions to ask. Exactly. Yeah. yeah, absolutely. Our hen health page is on our website. Second to our rehoming are our most popular hits. And we get hits from all over the world. There's no right. doubt about it. I really ought to send that link across to you because it would be really useful for your listeners. Yeah, we can put it on our show notes so that anyone who listens to this episode can go directly and hit that link if they need it and get right to those pages. Those videos showing the anatomy of where things are, I cannot stress how important that is to know the pet that you have so that you can help them if they have a problem. Right. We're doing all the common ones like vent gleat and bumblefoot and scaly leg so that we're helping 
those people that are not experienced on hen keeping to identify and then know what to do with their chickens. It's really important. So that's another aspect that since we last spoke, we've really begun to get sort of traction and get things underway and convert those donations that we get into really concrete educational support for anybody. People in the States are welcome to come and look at our videos because it's all going to be there as a resource free to access. That's brilliant. Yeah. Jane, do you want to introduce Gaynor and bring her in? So let me tell you, Gaynor joined, was it 13 or 14 years ago? 14. She used to work in London as a vet nurse, I should say. So she's got 30 years experience in vet nursing and she always wanted to move down to Devon. So she got in touch and said, oh, I love the fact that you're doing this charity. Can I help at all? And I said, yeah, it'd be great to sort of, you know, meet you. Let me know when you're down. And then I had another colleague join me and I said, well, where's that, where's that lady coming from London? And tell her to hurry up. We can kind of do with her. <laughs> and uh, anyway, Gaina literally walked down my drive one day and said, here I am. And so she started helping me to look after my chickens. I had 200 at the time and I kept all the ones that needed the extra attention. And then she would pop in the office. And I think at that time I had another member of staff or two. And we used to say, you know, stick the kettle on, you know, and have a little chat. And I remember saying to her one day, how do you fancy trying to take a few hen reservations for us? You know, we can't keep up. And she just said, yeah, I'll give it a go if you like. I don't mind. And that was 14 years ago plus. (laughs) Okay, so Gaynor, how many chickens do you have now? Me, I've got about 95. Okay. (laughs) (laughs) She's now heading up the whole of the rehoming operations Wow. And she's also head of welfare. So she is an amazing right-hand person to have. Thank well, you very welcome much. to the show. Good to be here. Yeah. So Jane was just telling us about the video series that British Home Welfare Trust has been working on. And you have had some input on that. Can you tell us a little bit about some of the subjects of the videos? We had about three days of filming and we had two really, really excited and helpful participants. So we have a a lovely vet called Sharon and she was doing the kind of the vetty stuff. So we did some hen examination guidelines videoing and then we did things like bumblefoot and just general stuff about worms, droppings, crop issues. What else do we do? Treating scaly leg. And then we had a volunteer who was very um, helpful to us called Lizzie and she did the outside hen husbandry videos. So we did how to clean out a hen house, how to disinfect it, merging hens, boredom busters for hens that are shut in through AI, and how to make a dust bath, things like that. And they all went really well. It was tremendous fun to do. And it's been really good actually being part of the editing process and going through it and saying, oh, I think we should take that out. Perhaps we could put this in here and things like that. And they're nearly finished. So it's really exciting. That's awesome. Yeah, fantastic. We were just talking about with so many new chicken keepers coming aboard, that educating everyone on just even the anatomy, how to do basic care is so important. I can bond with you. I was an animal nurse, a trauma nurse for 15 years in the veterinary world. And giving that knowledge back, it's very rewarding. Plus, it's rewarding for the chickens because they get the benefit of all the education that we have to give. And people who are new, It's so welcoming, but they want to know, how do I do this? I would have given my right arm for resources like this when I started keeping hens 20 years ago. Exactly. So of all the videos that you're putting out with the health, what are some of the most common ailments that you are seeing with people who are taking in the rescues? Yes. Well, I guess the most common things are things to do with reproduction, egg laying, egg peritonitis. That's always been a biggie. And the other thing, of course, is crop issues, and they, they tend to be the sourcrop or impacted or pendulous. And apart from that, I mean, most of the other things, things like scaly leg or bumblefoot, so environmental issues more than anything else. But when they first come out, quite often it's just behavioural stuff, so pecking and merging them into the flock and just people who haven't even seen a hen of feathers with the new feathers coming through and are kind of mm-hmm. like, what are these? It looks like mm-hmm. chain mail, you know, and just kind of understanding that hens will peck each other because they're going for the new feathers. So for someone who's never had hens at all, it's a massive learning curve. When I started in practice, I never saw a live chicken. I mean, you know, literally never saw one. And we'd, nothing came through the door all the years I was there. So we want more information out there so the vets can know what to do. I'm yeah. the same way. In the 15 years that I was in the veterinary medicine field, I never saw a chicken come in the door. And that's where the world has changed. You saw a seagull, though. I saved a seagull. (laughs) I was going to work. I see a seagull in the middle of the road and I'm like, hmm, that's not normal. So my work was like five minutes up and I'm like, okay, go get the leather gloves, the boxes, the towels. 
and I'm one little lady stopping traffic in a major road. Good for you. And the seagull is trying to attack me because, of course, they have no clue what's going on. And I'm yeah. like, I'm trying to save you, little one. So <laughs> was, I did was... manage to get her. We should check with the hospital you work with. I bet they see poultry now. Yeah. Well, that yeah. interesting. That brings us on to our, um, why really I wanted to introduce you to Gainer because we've been working with two wonderful people from the States, and I know that you know them. So that's Kelly Rutkowski and Rebecca Ganaris. Very amazing. good friends of ours. Oh, they're just amazing. We, yes. We've been working with them, particularly with Kelly, for probably five years plus now. And we are on the edge of launching our poultry veterinary guide. So this is a diagnostics tool and treatment options tool for vets. It's aimed at vets who've never seen chickens, basically. So the practice we worked at, somebody comes in the door and you go, oh my God, someone's coming with a chicken. So this is going to have decision trees. So you can work your way through. The hen's got a respiratory problem. So you can go through, does it do this? Has it got that? If so, go to here. And it works your way through. It will then lead you to scientific papers that we've put together, but they're going to be peer reviewed. So it's going to be up to date, the latest information. And then from that, we've got links to how to videos, how to draw blood, how to take a swab, how to give fluids, a whole range of stuff like that. We're going to have update newsletters with case studies on. We're going to have guest vets coming in talking about their specialized subjects. I'm getting chills right now because I know how much this is going to help our feathered friends, the chickens, so that if something happens to them, there's a place where they can go to the vet. The vet can get assistance if they were not trained and maybe learn some of this. And our dear friend, Dr. Rebecca, we are so lucky to have her as a friend and our veterinarian. She's just amazing. And she's a chicken lady herself, so she completely gets it. I think the main thing is that vets haven't been able to choose a drug to use safely and legally for most conditions because they don't know what the residue is in the eggs. So we've got this chart now. We've been taking advice from vets in this country and from our VMD, and we're pretty confident that it's a good way of saying, right, this hen's got this wrong with it. Should I use this? Should I use that? And it leads you through for you to make your own decision. Well, what we hope it's going to do is give vets anywhere much more confidence in how to diagnose and treat because right now what we hear is that because they aren't confident they elect not to do anything and that results in either a very sick bird and an upset owner or basically a put to sleep so we're really hoping that this is just going to enable people right across the world because we are going to be launching this globally Obviously, there will be sort of caveats to anybody using the facility to ensure that the rules and regulations apply in their country, because there are some differences in medications, obviously. And it is a subscription basis because we want to keep supplying content. And in order to do that, we need to be able to sort of draw in information, administrate it and put it back out there. But we're making it extremely reasonable because we want people to have that kind of insight and information on hen welfare and health It's not just going to be hens. We call it the poultry veterinary guide because we're also covering geese and ducks and turkeys. I don't know about the rest of the world, but I would imagine in the US that's tax deductible for a veterinary business. So it's an expense that one is well worth it and two, you can probably write off anyway. Okay, good. It would make, like you said, a vet less apprehensive about doing the wrong thing if they have a better guide. Most vets in vet school are only learning industrial medical care for chickens. They're not learning the backyard pet chicken care. So this is like a continuing education program to help get them up to speed. Rebecca always talks about she is one that believes in trying and trying to do palliative care. And she told us about a case just recently. (laughs) Another veterinarian said, put this animal to sleep. And she said, no, we're going to try palliative care. It was a chicken that could not walk. Right. And the original veterinarian suspected Marix and the owner was just not willing to euthanize the hen. She decided to keep her palliative care. And three months later, the hen is walking again. Wow. She was so happy when this chicken came in, this little barred rock, and was walking. It clearly wasn't Merrick, so she's walking. Exactly. (laughs) The other thing which I think is awesome is that with palliative care, there are more options out there now to take care of chickens in those states. 
The one is omnivore care, which you guys do non-prescription in the UK. In the US, it is by prescription only. It's the powder that turns into the liquid food for chickens. And we tell everyone we can, you need to have a relationship with your veterinarian over here because that is number one for palliative care is getting nutrients into your bird via liquid food. Even I love the fact if you're skilled enough to do it. Yeah, I love the fact that in the UK it's not prescription. It shouldn't be yeah. here, but it is. So having those different things available to chicken owners in their toolbox so that they can yeah. go to these things and your pages, everything that you're doing, it's world changing <laughs> for these animals. Are the veterinary professionals in the UK aware of this yet? Have you publicized it at all? No, we're hoping to launch, I would anticipate around May time, we're going to be deciding on a launch date, hopefully at our meeting next week. At the moment, as with all these big projects, there is a real push to get us over the line. But also, we don't want to miss out all the really good information that we want to be in there for vets. So we've got to get it right. We're determined to get it right. We know that the demand is out there. So yes, hopefully by May, we will be launching it. You are going to be one of our first ports of call. Please let everybody know because we will. You know, oh, people we that will. keep chickens, whether they've got a vet that's sort of very good or perhaps not so good, they might want to let them know. Knowing you the way we know you, Jane, we know it's going to be fantastic. <laughs> so We want to draw more people in like Rebecca as well. Yeah. Even if you've got brilliant vets over there, we'd love them to know about what we're doing. Get in touch with us. Tell us what you've done that's groundbreaking. We're all ears. We're here to make a difference to the welfare and the health and well-being of our wonderful feathered friends. So it's all aiming in the right direction, isn't it? Gaynor and I have been for some time now doing some work on challenging. I think I probably touched on it last time, but we challenge over here. It's called the Veterinary Medicines Directorate. And they're the body that dictate what animal can have access to what drugs, what's safe. And we've been looking at it for some time and realized that there are anomalies and that pet chickens in particular are not permitted to access certain drugs. And some of those can be really quite basic, like painkillers. Exactly. We've recently done this really comprehensive, I think it was 80 page consultation paper, wasn't it, Gaynor? Yeah, yeah, that's right. And we were able to take the opportunity. And one of the examples that we were able to give was of a cockerel that had really chronic oral canker. And we were able to sort of say, we've got evidence, you know, here here is the photograph. The poor bird couldn't even close his mouth properly. And legally, the lady that owned him was unable to get the vet to treat him. And yet, if it had been a pigeon or another animal, he could have had the treatment. That's an insanity for me. Who is it that dictates that you can treat one bird, but not another? Now, over here, there is a CARE Act that they have the meds they can't give them. But if it's a matter of life and death, the vets can prescribe it. Like That's pain medicine. almost always used in the case of the superloin hormone implant yeah. to stop ovulation. But to us, it's frankly ridiculous. I'm sure there are reasons those laws were passed, but they're really outdated. There are. The main reason they're passed is because chickens are categorized as livestock Mm -hmm. because they're food producing, whether you eat the bird or whether you eat the egg that the bird has laid. So that's where the complexity comes in. But there are anomalies because pigeons you can put in a pie. That's right. And rabbit is another one. A rabbit can have access to certain drugs. So can horses. Well, in Europe, they eat horses and certainly lots of people deem it fair to eat rabbits. Well, surely there's far less risk of somebody eating their pet chicken than there is of them eating a rabbit. What's the difference? And we do it in a very pragmatic way. We try to really think through what might come back to us. And obviously, we have to be aware of the residues that are left in eggs that people may eat. We're taking it very steadily. And the results of that consultation aren't due out until later this year. That's right, yeah. 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 We'll be keen to see the outcomes of that. And then we will either feed back the answers to our supporters because we want them to know that even if we fail, we're trying. We know we're climbing a mountain, but actually, if you don't take the first few steps, you're never going to get to the top, are you? So we're really comfortable with taking those steps and challenging and pushing the barriers and saying, well, you know, there's anomalies here. You can't say this is right for one animal and not right for this animal. That's exactly Um, what we say. Chickens fall between the cracks every every single time. time. When you have large animal livestock have 
every right to every medical care out there. And then you have small animal like bunnies and everything else that they have veterinary care. And in between sits the chicken. And that's the hurdle we're trying to get over right now. I'm going to put my historian hat on for a moment. The thing that I've seen over and over and over and over when I'm doing breed studies is that the attitudes about chickens changed largely after World War II. And that's globally. That's when the genetics companies started developing the hybrid hens. Yeah. And they disseminated worldwide. There was a lot of poverty and hunger after the Second yeah. World War. So they had the best of intentions. But yeah. the moment that chickens were commoditized is the moment they were sort of doomed to that place between the cracks. And it completely changed everything for the species. Now, if we think about it, that's less than 100 years. Yeah. We can fix it. We have to fix it for the reasons that we were discussing earlier. When you look at avian flu, when you look at COVID, when you look at how we're, as a species, treating other species, we have to. I would be very interested in learning more about your equivalent of the VMD, the Veterinary Medicines Directorate. What are the rules in America? Perhaps you can send us a link or something because it would be just interesting to gather more information because this is definitely going to be a long haul. We recognize that, but we're here to make a difference and that's it. So Us too. Absolutely. On our side, it would be the American Veterinary Association. I can absolutely email you contact information for the AVA. Okay, that would be brilliant. Thank we're in you. for the long haul too. And on our side, we have the ability to get some stuff out there from this point forward and how we should care for these living creatures yeah. and how we should show them the respect and the love they deserve. If you're, say, you consider yourself a homesteader and you want to breed your own birds for your consumption, none of this says you can't do that. What we are saying is if you choose to keep your hens in a different way, if you choose to keep your hens as pets, Or even if you're somewhere in between, your hens are pets, but they supply some food. You should have the resources there to give them all of the proper care for their best interests. For their best life. Exactly. And and treat them as any other pet would be treated. Yeah, I think that's the thing, isn't it? They're treated as such second-rate animals. And let's look at that number again, number four. They're number four. So let's put them in that spot that they deserve. It's hard work but we're all in it for the long haul. Yeah, Absolutely. and you I know? think I, I would also say that when people are hesitant or unsure and then they do go on and adopt the chickens, without any doubt, the feedback that comes back is one of total surprise that their birds were so bright, so sweet, so soft and so enriching. That was always the word that comes back at us the most, isn't it, Gaynor? Yeah, that the definitely. birds are enriching, life enriching. And people can't imagine their lives without chickens. And we would all agree with that, all four of us. Exactly. It's that message again of you want people to take on board chickens because you know that the vast majority of them will just get sucked into this wonderful world of sort of, you know, hen keeping. But at the same time, along with that needs to go the education because actually exactly. they are living creatures with needs and you can't just throw them in the back garden and hope you for can't. the best. You can't do veterinary care yourself. Veterinarians have gone to school for a very long time. They're trained in surgically how to do things. They know exactly what they're doing. They need to be able to be the ones doing it. And do not forget, U.S. listeners, that in July, the Federal Act goes into effect. We cannot purchase any kind of antibiotics at all on the shelf anymore. Starting in July, all antibiotics for all animals must be prescription. And have that relationship from the moment you get chicks Take your chicken in for a well visit and have a relationship with your doctor so that your foot is in the door. You're not calling a practice as a newcomer. You're calling a practice as a patient with a problem. And we know that chickens, once they show us signs, it's very quick because they hide them for so long. So veterinary care for chickens has to be quick. So having that relationship with your veterinarian when they're well is 100% important. Antibiotics, you're going to have to go to the vets. Even basic things like oxytetracycline we used to be able to buy off the shelf. We will not be able to access that anymore. Wow. Okay. How do you think that will impact people that keep chickens? It's either going to be like far less care than there used to be, or it's going to be a surge in very needed avian veterinary care. I think it could go one way or the other. I think we'll probably see some of both. Yeah. We talk to Rebecca all the time and she's like, People are putting way too much pressure on themselves as a pet owner to treat. I've gone to school for many years to know how to treat an animal. I'm a doctor. I'm a veterinarian. Take that pressure off yourself. Come to me. 
put that pressure yeah. on me to figure it out for you. And in the long run, you spend a lot less. You do. Yeah. You're not trying yeah. 10 different over-the-counter things that don't work yeah. at all. You're going to the doctor and getting the yeah. right stuff. Absolutely. So it's an amazing thing. And your course is going to do so much good. It's a game changer. Yeah. It's a game changer. Yeah, I'm hoping so. The poultry veterinary guide is more of a sort of, it's a lexicon of information. We want a vet, like Dana was saying, you know, if they're presented with a chicken in their surgery, that they can just tap into the computer, get all the information that they need and do it through these sort of decision trees to get the diagnostics to then help them make the decision and and offer the right treatment. It's efficiency again, which ultimately helps the hen and helps the owner because it reduces the costs, as you've just said. And we're going to be adding to this all the time and it's going to be fresh and, you know, just really interesting content. It sounds absolutely brilliant, and we will certainly do our part to publicize it as much as possible. Gaynor, I have one more question for you. Are all of your hens rescues, or do you have any other breeds mixed in there? I have one silky, but apart from that, they're all (laughs) rescues. I love that. They're all rescues. (laughs) Wonderful. So we want to thank Jane and Gaynor. You are amazing chicken ladies. Both of you inspire me to want to do better every single day for these little baby chickens out there. We love them so much. I always want to put a little super cape on and get out there after I talk to you and say, we can change the world. We can save the world together. It's always an absolute pleasure chatting with you. We could chat chickens all afternoon. Oh, we could. Yeah, it's delightful talking to you both. And we'll talk to you you. really soon. We can't wait to have you back on. Thank you. Bye-bye. Bye. 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 We just want to thank Jane and Gaynor one more time for joining us for a really fantastic chat. We will have links for the British Home Welfare Trust in our show notes. Make sure you follow them on social media. I love Jane. She's so sweet. So inspiring. And Gaynor is so sweet too. Mm -hmm. Okay, so let's move on to... Cracking the eggs. Cracking those eggs. Now, this week's Cracking the Eggs, we did... Victoria sponge cake with strawberry rhubarb compote. We love our rhubarb, don't we? We do. Well, it's in season. <laughs> I mean, we, we do try to cook with what's in season. Now, if you don't grow it, here's the thing. I went into Walmart to get bananas the other day. They have it right there. Yeah, you can get in, in the grocery store. The stalks, right there. Much more now than you ever yeah. used to be able to. So if you want to use it for like the gin fizz and you don't have it, you don't grow it, you can even go to Walmart to get it. I cannot have a garden without rhubarb. I'm kind of a rhubarb addict. Or a snob. Yes. Yes. <laughs> in joking. fact, I no, said, I might be a rhubarb snob. I was joking. No, I'm, I'm going to own that. I might be a rhubarb snob. I don't grow it, so I'm going to the Walmart to get mine. <laughs> That's fine. Well, a lot of homesteaders and, and gardeners grow it because it's a perennial. Yeah. And you don't have to do that much to it. Once you put it in the ground once, yeah. you're done. For a while, yes. I love perennials like that. Mm-hmm. I need to do everything like that. That's my mint. Yeah. It's like once you put it in once, you don't have to do it Perennials again. Perennials are fantastic. I don't turn my nose at bananuals, but I love my spring rhubarb. This is in honor of our conversation with the British Hem Welfare Trust. We've gone with a UK classic. Yes, we have. The Victoria Sponge. Victoria Sponge is a delicious layer cake with jam and whipped cream or clotted cream sandwiched between. Okay. Do you get any better than that? Right. Obviously, we're doing the compote in place of the jam. And once you've tasted strawberry rhubarb compote, you will not wonder why. This cake was developed in England, and it was named after Queen Victoria. It is supposed to have been her absolute favorite dessert. Now, in some old cookbooks, it's called a Victoria sandwich. Okay. And one of the things that helped this along, according to some food historians, one of the things that helped the development of this dessert is that baking powder was invented in 1843. Well, there's a little fact for you. Right? It was, I didn't it was, know that. Yeah, it was invented in the UK by a man named Bird. His last name was Bird in 1843, which is right there in Victoria's reign. Prior to that, most cakes had been yeasted. Okay. The reason this cake was named a sponge is because the baking powder gives it that light crumb and yeah. slightly spongy texture. Yeah. And it, the baking powder doesn't give the taste that the yeast does. The, the yeast will always give something a kind it has of a yeasty a, taste to it. It yeah. does. Mm-hmm. So this yeah. is way more mild. It doesn't give off an aftertaste. It's great. Right. So the strawberry rhubarb compote, we have included our recipe for that on the website. So when you go get the Victoria sponge recipe, you'll find the compote recipe. It's essentially strawberries, rhubarb, sugar. chopped with some water, sugar, and lemon juice. And you cook it down into like a jam. Exactly. Let's go over the ingredients for the cake. Okay. We need one stick, eight ounces of unsalted butter at room temperature, one cup of cane sugar, four free-range eggs, 
one cup of all-purpose flour, two teaspoons of baking soda, and a half a teaspoon of salt. Right. And the gluten-free equivalent to all of these. Right. You can use non-dairy butter and you can use all-purpose gluten-free flour. Exactly. All these recipes are geared towards both and will work with both. Yes. Then you want two-thirds of a cup of jam preserves or the strawberry rhubarb compote. The recipe, again, is on the website. One and a half cups of whipped cream and then... Optional powdered sugar. Queen Victoria liked it with powdered sugar on the top. That's a that's a girl from my own heart. I right? love powdered sugar. Sift that baby on the top. And then we included strawberries and edible flowers for garnish. Because you want it to look beautiful. Yes. Preheat the oven to 325 degrees and grease your two 8-inch cake pans. In a large mixing bowl, you're going to beat the butter and the sugar together until it's light and fluffy. You're going to add those eggs one at a time, continuing to mix well and scrape down the sides if needed. Then you're going to gradually add in the flour, baking soda, and salt. And then you're going to divide the mixture. Exactly. You're going to bake it for 25 to 35 minutes until it's starting to turn golden brown. Always have your trusty cake tester. Yes. I love that thing. I use it so much. Mine has a little man and a chef hat on the end. You just stick it in there. Depending on how your oven runs, like I start checking the cakes at about 20 minutes. Me too. Because my oven runs a little hot. Yeah. So, and you're right with the cake tester because you can get a lot of variance in cook time. I always, I've never take a cake out without chestnutting it first with that cake tester. Oh, heck no. No, no, no. You need to allow this to cool completely and then you're going to assemble it. Yeah. Here we go. You're going to spread a layer of compote or jam, if that's what you're using, on the bottom layer. You're going to top it with all that whipped cream. Put the top layer on and sift the powdered sugar all over it. Then you can garnish with whole strawberries, violets, and violas. Because they're all edible. Exactly. And they're also in season right now. Yeah. You can also sugar the flowers and the strawberries if you want a little bit more sparkle. And I would go for that option. Absolutely. (laughs) If you're making this for a fancy party, it was served at tea parties. And under Queen Victoria, tea parties became like a formal affair. Oh, yeah. So if you're doing this for a tea party or like a Mother's Day or graduation, anything like that, the sparkle's nice. We are going to link to our website with our article for candied violets. Oh, yes, we are. And all you need is an egg white and some sugar to candy flowers and fruit. You got it. Yeah, that's it. It's that easy. And then what do you do? You enjoy. Have your bestie over, talk chickens, cut a piece of cake, have a cup of coffee. That sounds good. We won't say tea. We'll say coffee. Yeah. (laughs) Yes, we will. So try it. You might like it. If you do, send us pictures. We want to see. Okay. So let's move on to retail therapy. Retail therapy. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. This week's retail therapy is a company called Exceptional Skincare. And you know we love our skincare. (laughs) We're all about this. So this is a great new woman-owned and woman-run company. And farm. Yeah, she's a farm, and she's making use of something that we all have plenty of. And that is eggshells. Eggshells. Now, would you ever think that all the different ways you can use your eggshells, you can use them in the garden, you can feed them back to the chickens, well, you can ground them even more into a powder and then make a facial mask out of them. The protein and the calcium and everything in these eggshells works wonders on your face. I've got to say, this is one of the best facial masks I have ever used. Oh, you love it. It's it's nice. Love it. So love you use it. the calming. I use the lavender. Right. The calming love is them. chamomile. Yeah. Love them. The smell of it alone. And my my actually my dog was following me around because I think he <laughs> wanted to lick it off my face. But they're super easy to use. So essentially it is the eggshell powder. It is whatever the botanical herbs. is going to be in there. Mm-hmm. And then there's some honey powder. Right. And you just add water to it. I just used a little teeny bowl, put it in there, added water until it was a paste, smooth it on. It's a chunky mask. So think mud mask rather yeah. than a peel mask. It's not a peel mask. It's it's chunky. And here's the thing. Eggshells are powerful, right? Mm-hmm. So the call to this product is that the eggshells are going to clean the pores, prevent fine lines and wrinkles, and soothe your skin. Oh, and it did. Because they're ground so fine. That they're not going to be sharp on your face, that's no, for sure. No, not at all. Not at all. And you're going to get all the extra protein and calcium and everything out of these eggshells. It really was like a 10-minute spa treatment. I mean, you put it on, the smell. I mean, whichever one you're using. Like, I use chamomile, you use lavender, and then there's thyme, and there's – what are some of the others? Let's go through. There's peppermint, which is awesome. Which is amazing, yeah. 
and there's thyme, and then there's a red clover. And rosemary. Rosemary, right, right. So, and I love the fact they that- They all have a little bit of a different function. In the package when you get it, you're going to get a paper that explains exactly what their functions yeah. are. Mm-hmm. So whatever you're feeling like you need a 10-minute break for, yeah, that's what you use. If you need protection for your face from the elements outside, the mm-hmm. time's the one you want to go with, a stimulant, the red clover, and balance for rosemary. Rosemary, yeah. We all need some balance. They smell so amazing when they're on your when they're on your skin. They really do smell so delicious. They've all done wonders for my skin, but the chamomile is the one I used last night, so it's fresh in my brain. Yeah. And I washed it off, and immediately my skin felt softer and smoother. Pores and skin were tighter. Oh yeah. Brighter. It's a hundred percent. It's it's a natural I mean, product, and it's used with stuff that is good for you. Yes. There's no chemicals in here or anything no. else. Mm. The peppermint, it hydrates the skin. It fades dark spots. I need that one. I need to use the peppermint one. Oh, the I have peppermint. a few little dark spots that I need to have. Oh, so it smells fading. amazing. But here's the other thing. It's just good to take that 10 minutes for yourself. Mm-hmm. Read a book or sit with your chickens. If, if you want to go out in the yard with it on, who cares? Whatever. Yeah, I, yeah, absolutely. I just, I was, I was about to shower. So I, I put it on before I showered and then just lay on the bed and close my eyes for 10 minutes. Yeah, just do so something nice. for you. Like you mm-hmm. said, if you need a 10-minute br- uh, little nap or just reading a book for 10 minutes or taking that time to say, for 10 minutes, I'm not going to do anything except for sit here with this mask on. Here's the thing. It's from eggs. It's and you can feel it working about five minutes in. You sort of feel a pleasant flush and tingling right. sensation in your skin. Now, at my age, at first I wasn't sure if that was the mask or a hot flash. Yeah. <laughs> but it is the mask working. The mask is working. It's, it's tingling. And Chrissy will agree with this. I have the most sensitive skin you have ever seen. Oh, yes. Yeah. Like you put your mask on first. So I said, if you didn't break out, then I'm oh, right, exactly. Nobody's going to break out. So these are really good. They're natural. They're awesome. And it's a way to give yourself a 10-minute break. And they're great. So here's the other thing. When you get it shipped to you, you're going to love this packaging. packaging. is ridiculously cute. This is a great gift for people too. Oh, the best gift for a chicken lady yeah. out there. So you can get them single or you can get the whole range and it comes in an oversized half dozen egg carton. We'll put some photos up of it on our We're going to put Instagram. photos up because it's just too cute it's not so cute. to. Yeah. It's an oversized half dozen egg carton. Yep. And inside when you open it up, these There's glitter cardboard eggs that hold the masks. It's not glitter that gets everywhere either. No. It's embedded in the cardboard, I think. It's so nice. I mean, the whole thing about it. The presentation is everything about it. And the most beautiful thing is that it works really, really well. And it's a way to reuse these eggshells. It's yep. a way that this farm chose to say, we're going to reuse these eggshells. And I love it. Mm-hmm. I love it. And I love the packaging of it. You can get a nice headband to keep your hair out of your it face. Ha- and there's a chicken on the headband. Yeah. So go it's over like to this chicken website. Chicken Lady Spa Day. It's what it is. So go over to the website and check them out. They have free shipping over $50. It's just really some cool stuff. You're going to love it. It's fantastic. Okay. So let us know what you think. If you do it, send us pictures with your mask on. We want to see them. Yeah. <laughs> we'll show you ours. Yes, we will. Okay, so let's tell everybody what we're going to be talking about next week. Next week, we are spotlighting a hybrid. Yes. Or a pair of hybrids with a really interesting history. We are doing the waiting true blue and true green. Yes, we are. Main topic, we're having a really fun chat with Ginger from McMurray Hatchery. Yay, our sweet friend. Cracking the eggs, we're doing Spanish rice with eggs and chickpeas. Yummy for lunch, dinner, or breakfast. Mm -hmm. Retail therapy, we're talking to an author, Emma Berry, about her new book, Chick Magnet. And it's good. It's good. (laughs) You might need to read this one. So what should we tell everybody to do until next week? Hug your chickens. Every day and kiss them too. We'll talk to you next week. Bye-bye. Bye. If you'd like to see more of us, please follow us on Instagram at Coffee with the Chicken Ladies. If you'd like to help us grow the podcast, please leave us a written review on Apple Podcasts. If you'd like to become a patron of the show, please visit our Patreon page, patreon.com slash coffee with the chicken ladies. Thanks for listening.